Hey there, cool kids. Welcome back to another fun, customized bicycle build. <laughs> this time we're taking this scrap bike that I picked up for $10 from my neighbor that appears to be some sort of vintage cholo piece, uh, and we are going to fully restore it. We're going to find out what the heck it is in the first place, and we're going to fix everything that's wrong with it and turn this beautiful chopper-style bike into the prize jewel it was meant to be, this time on Make and Believe. Right, so as you can see, this bike has seen better days. It has clearly been garaged. Um, actually, it, it might have even been sitting in the backyard because it is full of cobwebs. It is full of dirt and dust and grime, and the chain is just rusted out. So we're going to see what we can do with all of the original parts as far as I can take it because I don't like anything OG to go to waste. I've got some three-in-one oil. We're going to slap on that chain and on the spring that holds up this super cool kickstand. Uh, but first and foremost, I think this thing needs to be sprayed down, sprayed off, wiped down, and cleaned. Uh, so let's start there. that's already better like night and day. There are a lot of issues with this particular ride. Um, I have noticed there are no brakes. I'm not entirely sure how that's supposed to work, but um, there are none. <laughs> and that's a problem. Um, also, the the steering bar, the handlebars are not like totally aligned with the steering column with the front tire. It's, it's quite off. It's like at least 10 degrees off. So that's gonna have to be corrected. Um, that being said, I think this is pretty salvageable. While the chain is really rusty, I think if I put a bunch of oil on it, that's going to be fine. I think that the uh, kickstand is going to be just fine. The pedals that are on this bike are probably just fine. And I'm seeing the, uh, the back tire actually has a really cool rim. I think the front tire does too, if I can get underneath the spray paint that's been applied to it. I bet you that they're a matching original set. That's pretty cool. So the spray paint has to come off of this bike um, and the electrical tape, which is another way that they've made the bike black, needs to be removed, probably degummed. So those are going to be the first steps. But first and foremost, I'd like to find out what the hell kind of bike this actually is. Um, there is a logo plate on the front of it, but I just can't see it. I can't read it. Um, maybe it's just my old man eyes. Let's get the camera on it here. It's right here. Uh, so I think the first thing I'm going to do is get out some sandpaper and try to get some of the spray paint off of this so that I can identify what the make and model of this bike is. If I can do that, then I can probably figure out how the brakes were supposed to work originally <laughs> and maybe even get some more, um, some more ideas about what this bike was supposed to look like in its original mint condition form. Uh, and then we can work towards restoring it from there. All right, we're back in the shop here uh, to work on this logo plate. And I actually just got really excited because while I can't read the actual writing on it due to the buildup of the spray paint, what I can see there in the middle of that logo plate is a star. And that star to me looks like the Schwinn logo. And I love me some Schwinn bicycles. That would be very cool if that's what this turned out to be. Anyway, let's get to work on this. I've got some 150 grit um, 3M sandpaper. That's pretty smooth. Um, so I don't think I'm gonna be doing too much damage with this. Uh, I could always move down to like steel wool or some Scotch-Brite, but I think this is probably the way to start. Let's see what I can do about removing that paint, but preserving the logo next. Well, you probably 
saw that come to life while I was working there in fast speed, but this is a Schwinn. <laughs> Look at that beautiful emblem. I love these 3D high quality manufactured emblems because applying the sandpaper just took off the, the raised edge and then the lower section that still has the paint on it is like now two-toned custom oh my goodness it's a two-toned custom painted logo i freaking love it at any rate what we're looking at here is a schwinn stingray apparently however i've never seen a stingray quite like this usually um the schwinn stingrays have that big banana bicycle seat with like the loop on the back i'm gonna have to do some googling i'm gonna i, I need to understand fully if this is just somebody took a logo plate and slapped it on this bike or if this really is legitimately, or maybe it's just made with the, the steering column from a Schwinn Stingray. I don't really know. So I'm gonna go to the internet next. Let's do some digging. Let's see if we can find out what kind of bike this really is. All right, pause on my way to the internet. I'm seeing the Stingray logo here now on both the back, fatty, and the front, tires which is super exciting. So this might be a Stingray after all. I've just never seen one that quite looks like this before. So onwards to the internet to Google. Okay, so a quick Google image search for the Schwinn Stingray is showing me a bike that looks very different than what I've got here, um, by and large. This is what, I, in, in my memory, this, this one I've got highlighted up here, is what I was remembering seeing in my mind as a, a Schwinn Stingray, like an original classic, like a crate bike. Um, so it's got that banana style seat I was talking about with a little like hole over handrail bar for anybody like sitting. Okay, essentially this could be a seat for two people, <laughs> bottom line, and you've got the driver in the front and your passenger in the back can reach around their back and hold on to this little handlebar to kind of give themselves some better footing. Um, I'm seeing a lot of differences with this particular model than what I've got in-house, which initially got me a little curious as to what, what's going on here. But then I scrolled down a bit more and I found this. This looks exactly like what I've got. This is a Schwinn Stingray Chopper. Now we're talking. This is much more in line with what I'm looking at here. So if I pop up to, here's one for sale on Etsy for about 300 bucks. This looks very similar to what I've got in house. Now I've got a different seat um, than what was originally offered with the bike. Can I make this bigger? Let's make, yeah, there we go. Uh, let me adjust my camera just slightly to get that better in frame. So, um, oh, I can get even bigger with this. So yeah, if you look at that seat, that's a little different. It still has that handrail thing for the back if you wanna reach around and ha hang on to it for dear life <laughs> as, as another driver is riding you around. Um, so I've got an aftermarket seat installed. I've also apparently got some aftermarket handlebars or this person has aftermarket handlebars. I'm not entirely sure which, but what I am seeing up on those handlebars here are what it looks to me to be a brake and a brake line running down the side of the back bike, uh, all the way to the back wheel from this, um, from this picture, I can't really tell how that brake works. It could be a disc on the other side. It could also be uh, the type of brake that just grabs the tire. I'm not really sure. Uh, but knowing that this is a Schwinn, this is an actual Schwinn Stingray chopper, um, that's gonna get me a long way to be able to, to find the right parts to put this thing back in order again. So that's, that's pretty darned exciting. It's also cool to see that a lot of this hasn't been changed. This um, little triangle portion in the middle, I thought that was an add-on aftermarket. I thought somebody had just done that uh, in order to make it look cool and make it look more like a motorcycle. Um, hang on, my door is blown open behind me and you can suddenly see a glare on the screen. That's better, where were we? Okay, so yeah, I thought somebody had add that on, but it looks like it's a part of the OG frame style for this particular model, which is pretty neat. Um, and yeah, actually everything looks pretty, pretty OG on the model I've got. This chain guard looks pretty OG. The pedals look a little different, but you know what? Pedals are easily swappable. And it looks like they've actually put aftermarket tires on theirs where I seem to have the originals with the Stingray logo, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, now I kind of know what one of these bikes looks like before anyone has messed with it with a can of spray paint. So I have some sort of idea of where I'm going with this. There are some other shots we can take a look at. Here's the other side profile. Oh man, look at the rust on this. I guess it wasn't just mine. 
yeah, they needed to put like a zinc plating on this or something. I don't. I really don't know. Maybe this bike was made out of uh, rusty, rusty parts like steel. This is a really good looking bike, even with those handlebars. But I have to say, I kind of like the Cholo style um, up up bend handlebars, the Harley chopper style that were put on the my model. So I think I, I'm probably going to keep them if I can get them to line up properly and get them cleaned up and not, you know, not be spray paint black. Let's take a look from the back, see if we can figure out what's going on with that brake. Gosh, I don't see a disc on it. I'm not really sure how this brake operated. It definitely has that line that's running all the way down the frame to the back side. Can I see it on here? Yeah, it's definitely there. Let's zoom in a bit more. Yeah, here's that brake line running all the way down the side, down to here. Oh, it does. It looks like a tire grab. Let me zoom out a little bit, get a crisper picture. Yeah, it looks like a tire grab sort of brake. All right, well, I can probably consult my local bike shop. Fortunately, I have an amazing one and figure out what parts we can order in order to get this thing fully restored back to its original, at least as close as possible. I still want this to be a custom bike. I'm probably not gonna do the original seat. I like what's on it. I like the handlebars that have been refit, but I do wanna custom color it and I definitely wanna get a brake system and the gear drive in working order. So let's start there. Uh, I'm also going to need to realign my front wheel with my handlebars that's going to be a big deal uh, and if we can get that far i think we're headed in the right direction right pardon the uh fan noise i've got a cheeky little 3d print going and it's like 110 degrees here today in los angeles so i've got the fan on my printer so it doesn't overheat and spaghettify my print um as you can see, as I noted earlier, there is some electrical tape here on this piece. So I think first and foremost, before I start to work on the spray painted portions, I'm going to get this off and maybe use some gunk remover. We'll see how bad the sticky stuff is underneath um, once it's removed. But that's step one. Nice, that is better already. It is super sticky though from the tape residual. So I'm gonna pop the entire seat out. Uh, it's got a little clamp here. Oh my goodness, might take some oil. Anyway, I'm gonna pop the seat out so that I can work on this thing independently and uh, get some Gooby Gone or some similar product on there to remove that stickiness. All right, the seat is removed and up on the shop table and I'm going to try to use crud clutter adhesive remover. I think this is the right stuff for the job, uh, although it's still pretty toxic. Look, the package says non-toxic, toxic, biodegradable, earth-friendly, all of that's horse, seriously. Uh, I keep it in a bag and I keep it in my chemicals drawer. <laughs> this is not good stuff. You don't wanna use it unless you absolutely have to, but when you do absolutely have to, like in cases where you've got a perfectly good piece of steel covered in adhesive, this is the time for it. I've got an old rag that is actually end of life and ready to throw away um, that I'm gonna use for this because I don't ever wanna use it for anything else besides adhesive remover after this task is done. Okay, let's flip our stuff ready to spray. All right, I'm gonna let that soak on there for a minute. Clean up all my residual and then go to town. Yeah, this is gonna take a couple of applications, but already it's better. Oh man, that was some nasty stuff. All right, a couple more applications later, I will see you when I'm ready to reinstall this seat. All right, to the touch, that is actually, uh, pretty. all the gum is gone. All the glue residue is now gone. It's not perfect. It's not 100% brand new. Uh, I might put some sandpaper on it at some point to make it look better, but this is doable for me to move forward. Now, um, before I reinstall it, unfortunately, I am noticing some rust. So I think it is actually time for me to start sanding out this main body frame piece. And let's just see what color this is underneath, if any. I'm fine with chrome, uh, but that'll be next. 
Right, so to attack the body of this beast, I have dropped down to a nice 60 grit. Uh, it's a lot more rough, a lot more coarse, and I think it'll help me take the paint off a little faster. So with that being said, let's get to work. All right, that 60 grit is working a treat. I don't know if you can see it on camera, but there is a little bit of blue um, on top of what looks like chrome and what looks like some rust. And I'm not sure if this blue was just accent detail work on top of the chrome base uh, and the chrome was exposed, or if there was a whole layer of blue at one point and I'm just, you know, sanding directly through that to get down to the chrome with the 60 grit. Either way, I'm not entirely concerned about it. Um, I'm not sure this bike, whoa, my goodness, knocking the camera around. I'm not sure this bike wants to be blue, but if it does, it's certainly gonna benefit from a reapplication at the end of the process. So I'm gonna go ahead and sand and sand and sand until I get down to the chrome, and we will see what this frame looks like. When I'm complete, I will spare you the work session, and we'll just jump straight there. All right, I'm about probably a good three hours into hand sanding <laughs> and I've got the main part of the frame exposed and I've, you know, obviously taken care of uh, the seat stick uh, and I've also gotten pretty far into, well, let's roll around to the other side here, into cleaning up this pedal. Uh, I still got the back end to work out. Um, but I haven't really honestly gotten very far after three hours of hand sanding, so I might shift gears and get my power sander out. I don't know, there's something really cathartic and satisfying about doing this by hand, so I might keep at it with some sandpaper until I'm done, but this is where I've gotten to so far. Um, I've decided that I'm not going to go ahead and clean up this wheel, because I think eventually when I turn this into an e-bike, I'm going to go with a front hub motor so that I can have the option of electric in the front or um, manual drive from the real rear wheel and not have them conflict. I can just decide what I want to do and do it that way. I've already got an e-bike that has pedal assist, so I think this is going to be more of an electric motorcycle, and I'm going to keep the, uh, keep the front and the rear drives separate on this puppy. So that's kind of the plan. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is switch gears because honestly sanding is just, <laughs> it's getting a little repetitive and tedious at this point and I need to take a break from it. And what I'm going to focus on is trying to straighten out. As you can see, the wheel is definitely off from the steering column. See that? So what I need to do is straighten that out so that the wheel is properly lined up in the steering column. Um, and I don't really know how to do that, to be honest, because I've never worked with a chopper-style bike before. So what I'm going to do, uh, I've gotten in here and I can see that I've got hex head, Allen wrench head um, bolts throughout the entire assembly. Uh, there are some more down here in the sides and coming up from the top. And I think, this is just supposition at this point, but I think that that is going to be the key to this, this right here. So these two bars are just not properly aligned with the wheel well. Um, and I think a combination of adjusting where the uh, the wheel is positioned, that, that spoke down there, with this here, this middle piece, and with this top piece that mirrors the middle piece, that's going to be the trick to straightening those bars out. Uh, we'll, we'll get everything in line. So that's my supposition, but these bolts are totally rusted in. So I'm going to get some um, three-in-one oil. By the way, let's talk a bit about that for a minute. I've mentioned this before, but I haven't shown you what I'm talking about. This is the three-in-one oil. You can pick this up at most uh, any hardware store anywhere. This is what you want if you've got a hinge that squeaks or if you've got really, really old rusted out things like this chain or these bolts. So I'm going to put some drops on this. I'm going to work them back and forth. I'm going to get my Allen wrench out and I'm going to see if I can loosen all of these up, straighten out the entire assembly, and then tighten it back down again. That's step one. If I can't do it that way, I'm going to have to do some further research, but we shall see what we shall see. That'll be next. Wow, well that was actually surprisingly easy. Um, if any of you at home are trying to straighten out a chopper style, oh my goodness, let me grab my Allen wrench. Got away from me. All right, if any of you at home are trying to straighten out a chopper style handlebar, uh, what I did was I loosened this 
bolt on each side, and then I loosened, which you can see is still drenched in oil, this bolt on each side. And then essentially, I just straightened it out. I straightened out the wheel with the handlebars. I guess it's still not perfect, but it's so much better than it was that it's kind of ridiculous. And then I tightened those bolts back down, and it was as easy as that. So, with that done, I guess it's back to sanding. <laughs> <laughs> while I ponder what the next steps on this beast are gonna be. All right, the journey continues. I am getting down to the metal. Uh, the more that I expose, the more I am seeing this blue everywhere, um, all over the frame. So that's kind of a clue as to what this bike may have originally looked like. Um, that or someone painted it blue before they painted it black. It's really hard to tell. Uh, I have cleaned up the kickstand pretty well now, and that looks pretty nice. Um, and flipping over the bike, I started on a hunt for the serial number, and I found it here. However, uh, it has not given me any further information than I had before. Extensive Google search has provided nothing. I called Schwinn, and apparently uh, they were acquired by another... The brand of Schwinn was acquired by another company, so they don't have, like, information on what they are calling antique bikes. I don't know if I would call this antique as much as vintage, um, but it's certainly older than what they've got in their records. And so they were no of no help. Um, <laughs> this quest is uh, an important one because I need to find essentially the right type of brakes, the right parts for this. So I might have to dive into the internet forums and talk to other people who own this kind of bike to figure out what kind of parts I need to order for this. Um, but anyway, found the serial number. Uh, the model number and date of manufacture would have been on a sticker that would have been right here. Uh, and that is long since gone. So I think that that information is just lost to time at this point. Um, all right, so the sanding continues, I guess. I'm going to start probably taking off component pieces once I get the frame completely uh, cleaned up. Uh, like you know, the chain guard and stuff, and maybe the handlebars, and clean those up separately and reassemble them. So that is next. All right, I am pretty much down to bare metal on the chain guard. At least as close to bare metal as I'm gonna get. <laughs> and I'm feeling pretty good about this. So I'm gonna get this back on the bike and move on probably to the handlebars next. I'm not really sure, it's just a piece at a time from here on out. All right, I actually went to the fender next. That came out pretty nice. I mean, there is a little bit of rust damage, but this bike is vintage, so I'm not trying to hide the damage. I actually think every little tiny imperfection in this metal makes it look cooler. So uh, I'm gonna pop this fender back on, and I do think it's time for the handlebars next. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I got the handlebars off, and there was one of these uh, clamps on either side. Uh, underneath them, I found <laughs> this little, these little metal pieces. Uh, that are clearly from, like, a hose clamp that somebody cut in order to provide a spacer, I guess, in order to make the clamps fit right. Because, again, these handlebars are not original to this bike. Um, but, you know, cool. Cool stuff. Uh, I'll make sure those go back in when I'm cleaned up and ready to reinstall. All right, so after I cleaned up, well, relatively cleaned up the handlebars, <laughs> the fender, the pedals... Uh, Etc. I decided to get back on the internet and try to find out exactly what year this bike was. Um, as I mentioned, punching in the serial number gave me nothing, and the sticker that had the year and make and model number on it was, was long gone um, and lost to time. So I called Schwinn. Uh, I got no help. Uh, they actually are owned by another company, and they pointed me to serial number lookups online, which also didn't help. But one of those lookups pointed me to the Vintage Schwinn catalogs, and here is where I started to go way down the rabbit hole. Uh, this is pretty cool. It's bikehistory.org slash catalogs, in case you are interested in going there yourself. Um, <laughs> it's something to look at. All of these catalogs from 1988, all the way back to like the 60s, um, of all of the products Schwinn put out every year. I went through pretty much every one of these. I mean, I didn't go through the BMX ones, obviously, because it's not a BMX style bike or the lightweight version or the road bikes. Um, this, you know, this is a, this is a Stingray chopper. And then I did a whole bunch of history on, you know, the history of or research on the history of Stingrays and when they came out, when they made each model, blah, 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 blah. I still wasn't finding what I was looking for. Finally, it, uh, I came to, where is it here? Uh, 
I came to a website that pointed me in the direction of... Oh, yeah, this is the old stuff. This is the, like, original Stingrays before they even started to make the, the chopper. So you've got, like, the Fastback here, the uh, the Deluxe, and then the, the OG Stingray. This is what they were... This, is a, this picture is straight out of the catalog for this article that I found. At any rate, I finally found a link to this YouTube video that I am going to put up called Schwinn Stingray. And you know what? I'm just going to give you like a little bit of it here. Uh, and I'll put a link in the description below. I'm going to mute the audio, but this is the bike <laughs> that these children are riding with that fat tire. I will link to this in the description because I don't want to uh, have any like copyright strikes or anything here on this video. That led me down the path of looking at these new versions. These came out in 2004, and this is pretty much the model of bike that I have. Obviously, I don't have the original seat or the original handlebars, but I've got this model with the 20-inch, it's the 20-inch Street Series is what it's called. And um, this website here, Jeans BMX, had a really nice article I will link in the description as well uh, about this particular series. I went on to Google uh, images because I really wanted to find out what my bike looked like originally. Uh, and I found in the Wayback Machine archived schwinstingray.com slash bike uh, gave you the 16 inch for children and then the 20 inch, the adult size bike, um, which is what I have here in the shop. Uh, there are also other versions of this. Apparently they put out an electric model. I'm, I'm not really sure how that worked back in 2004. Um, it, you know, my bike is, my e-bike is fairly new and I just can't imagine they had that down to a science back then, but maybe they did. Uh, there were limited edition versions of this uh, that uh, actually I think these were all sold specific, exclusively through Walmart uh, and they just had different fender options and like different bolts and stuff. Uh, and then there was a spoiler series that has this nice um, curved back. So mine's definitely not that model either. Mine is the 20 inch street series and clicking on this, going into that page, uh, let's see if it'll go here. Sorry, technical difficulties, but clicking on that page brings you to, uh, still in the Wayback Machine, the archived, you know, press stuff for when this was sold back in 2004. And sure enough, there's a blue color. Uh, I wasn't able to get that blue color image here because the Wayback Machine didn't archive all of the different color options on the sale page, but no big deal. Now that I knew what I was looking for, the 2004 20 inch Street Series Stingray, uh, I was able to do some Google searching and sure enough, I found it. Um, this is what the front of it looked like and I am sure that these pieces here were that blue, this exact same blue from sanding it down and taking a look at it in depth. Um, and it's interesting enough to note that my logo was actually black and silver, that beautiful silver that popped up the first time. Um, so this is the bike head on, and then this is, is a zoomed out, larger version. This is what the bike looked like originally. And this is awesome to see. That fender back here that I just sanded down, it was originally chromed out. It looks fantastic. It looks like the uh, steering columns were also chromed with some decals on them that have been long since removed. Um, and then you can tell where it was blue, and that's pretty much where I'm seeing remnants of blue. I haven't gotten to this back portion back here in the sanding yet. Uh, I'm still working on the bottom part of the frame, uh, but yeah, this this is it. This is what it used to look like with all of these little weird green sti flame stickers on it. Um, it's gonna look so much cooler when I'm done with it. At any rate, I also noticed they have it prop the front wheel propped up on a Coke bottle because once you get up on that kickstand, the front wheel is loose in the air of the way that it sits. Um, and then it has these interesting little spoke, like fire emblems in the middle of the wheels that are no longer on the bike. So I'm not sure what happened with that, but those are gone. Uh, and, and I'm not, I, I don't think I'm gonna miss them. <laughs> I'm also seeing that I have, in addition to an aftermarket seat and an after, aftermarket handlebar set, I also have aftermarket pedals. It looked like they originally came with some chrome um, metallic ones. And my disc uh, cartridge has been painted black instead of the original chrome. At any rate, it is really good to see what this bike looked like at the outset. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be putting it back to this color, especially with the green contrast um, on the on the blue, the details on the blue. Uh, but we'll see. This is this is really informative, and it's a great step in the right direction. So I'm going to get back to restoring what I've got, and then see what I can do about customizing the paint the way I want to see it done. Good morning. It's a brand new day. Uh, we are looking at a pretty exciting day potentially here because I think I've got the bike almost down 
to the level of bare metal where I want it to start actually painting again. And I think I know how I want to paint it. So let's get just stuck right in and I'll tell you what the plan is. Okay, so for the most part, this plate here, the rail guard, the fender, um, the front, I guess trunk, whatever you want to call that, <laughs> that holds the front tire, uh, and then probably also the handlebars are going to remain bare metal or become chrome. So I want to get them essentially chromed out, very similar to how the fender looks and how the, the chain plate works looks. I would like for that to, to be the same look on both of these pieces here too. I think uh, also remaining chrome will be the stem for the seat. I think eventually I might change this seat out. It just doesn't quite match the look of the bike, but it's a perfectly good seat. So for now, it's just going to stay. Uh, for part one of this build, for getting things restored, uh, I'm going to ignore the seat and pretend it's awesome. <laughs> uh, for the rest of the bike, I think we're going with a gold, and I don't want a bright, blingy gold. I'd really like a rich, sparkly, dark gold, but I'm not entirely sure what color I'm going to use yet. It might be something more along the lines of, like, burnished amber. Um, we'll see. We will see. Um, I might even go copper if I can find a dark enough copper. But that's kind of the plan, is a gold or a copper for the frame. And the frame for this bike encompasses everything from the neck here down across, wrapping around the, the rear wheel, and then everything below the stem and then back up to the neck. So that's all gonna be one piece that I'm going to paint at once. So what's exciting about today is I'm going to actually disassemble the bike pretty much completely and get that frame away from all of the other pieces so that I can paint it uh, and then worry about individual cleanup on all the remaining parts where I want them to be cleaned and, and, and getting those to be the right color. Uh, and then I can do a reassembly, which is always the most fun parts of these builds. So that's today. Uh, it's a pretty busy day, so we'll see how far I get <laughs> more soon. All right. I've got my frame isolated, and I've got my pedals taped off. I'm not going to remove those and try to mess with those bearings in order to get a different paint color going on um, for, the, for that gear. I think everything here is going to be copper or gold, and I think actually what I'm going to go with is... I've consulted my paint cabinet, and I have found this nice hammered copper. So it'll give it a little bit of texture that'll kind of, you know, gloss over any any inconsistencies or damage from this frame that is quite old at this point. I'm about 18 years old if this came out in 2004. Um, the question is, because like all my paint cans, I've used this in the past, is there enough in this bottle and uh, will it actually spray? So we'll see. Uh, if not, I might have to run to the store for more paint. But I'm going to try to use this hammered copper for the frame and we'll see how it comes out looking against the chrome. Well, the good news is I love the color. I think it's it's going to look really, really, really nice, actually. Uh, the bad news is <laughs> the what I had left in that can only got through this side of the bike, so I'm going to have to pick up some more paint, which is cool because by the time I'm back, this should be dry enough to flip, uh, and then I will hit the other side of it, uh, and then we will probably apply like a glossy, clear enamel finish to keep that paint nice and protected, because I plan to put this bike through its paces. All right, I got her assembled. Just got back from a little test drive. You know what? Let me show you what we got here because I'm pretty stoked about the restoration process so far. Here we go. Yeah, dude, look at that beauty. Look at that beauty that came out of that garage sale special. <laughs> look at her shine. That is just a beautiful, beautiful bike right there so i think i'm gonna call it um with the uh copper and chrome finish on the restoration what i've managed to do here i still haven't put the brakes on yet um but I'm, I'm gonna work with my uh my shop guy on that to find the right parts and then i did identify the brake mounts right there so they are rim brakes on the rear wheel. I know where I'm going with that, and I'm very close to getting this thing wrapped up. In fact, you know what? I'll do the brakes before I wrap this project, but I think that's about it for restoration. This is a part one of two video, and part two is going to be where we take this after I've fully restored it, gotten the brakes on, and I'm totally happy with the ride, um, and make it into an electric 
essentially motorcycle, an e-bike. Um, and that's going to be super fun too. I have also managed to re-index the front tire. Taking the whole thing apart and putting it back together again was a super cathartic exercise, I've got to say. I highly recommend that if you're going to be restoring any bike. i still got a little work to go on the handlebars. They're not perfect. And I've got a guy who does lowriders that's my friend down the street who recommended some good chroming solutions to clean up all the chrome places that I've sanded the paint off of, so I'm probably going to do that too. Uh, but those are finishing touches. I am super pleased with how far this bike has come. Um, and I'm super stoked to turn it into an e-bike. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to get the brakes on, and then we are going to move forward with part two. Right, I have picked up a set of brake calipers. Um, that's the first step <laughs> in the right direction. It's essentially two of these units uh, that go onto the mounting posts on the back wheel of the bike, uh, on the frame. Uh, this is called a tensioner rod right here. This actually, go, there's three holes. Let's actually move over to the bike. Take a look. I've already put that one on. Uh, all right, so if I can get a shot in here of this, maybe. Awfully tight. No, I don't know. All right, this is the best we're gonna get. So there's this rod, or this, uh, this post that comes up. The middle here is gonna go over that, and then the little tensioning rod is gonna go into one of three holes on the far side here. Uh, and the guy at the bike shop suggested I pick the center one to start with. I think he's right, um, seeing as, as how the other side fit pretty well. So what I'm gonna do is drop this on there, and then I'm gonna put a screw through the top uh, that came with the, with the brakes and then I'm going to adjust the brake such that, let's come around to the other side here, I've already done this one, such that the pad will hit the rim and only the rim when it's fully engaged. So once I've got that set up, and I'll be honest with you, at this point I am not confident that these are going to be big enough to get around the tire, but this is the, this is the set the guy at the bike shop closest to me sold me, and I like their prices, so uh, that's where I went first. Once I get these on here, I'm going to go over to my favorite bike shop, which is quite a, a distance away from me, but not, you know, unreasonable, uh, in another town. And I'm going to have them actually run the brake line and install the, uh, the brake handle for me. I think the first time I have this on there, I would like a professional to do it and have that part done right, just so I can have full confidence in these brakes. Um, because I am not a professional <laughs> and I do plan on riding this thing pretty hard and of course eventually turning it into an e-bike. So brakes are going to be super key. At any rate, that's where I'm at. I'm going to finish the install of these and then we'll uh, take it to the next steps. All right, so I've got my rim brakes attached and all aligned. And now the next step, I have uh, picked up a lever, control rod, and I have picked up six feet of brake line cable and I'm starting to uh, attach that. So let's demystify this a little bit because I'd never done it before and it was, you know, it's a little intimidating when you don't know how to do things for the first time. Um, as you may notice, there is a channel running down at the top of this until you get to this cap, but there's also a channel, I don't know if it's gonna get it on camera, right there, in the cap and in this front part. So essentially what you want to do is untwist this and untwist this from the from the cap here um, until you've got the channel completely exposed and lay your brake line in there such that this little knob that's on the end of your brake line fits perfectly in this uh, hole that's meant for it inside the brake when you pull it out. Then you run your channel line through or your uh, brake line through this channel and once you've got it in place here you can go ahead and tighten this back up so that the channel's locked and your brake line's not gonna come out of it. So that, so far so good there. Uh, next, what we wanna do is essentially run the brake line back to where it needs to go. And this particular bike has <clears throat> a couple of cutouts here in the frame to allow for the brake line to go inside the bike and come back out over here and then run down to where it needs to go. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna drop my brake line in this hole, feed it down through, Get a little pair of needle nose pliers or maybe uh, wire grabs that I have and pull it out through there and then start to figure out how to get it attached down here and trim off any excess, if there is any. I don't know, six feet might be just enough to get it where it needs to go on this bike. 
Okay, so the brake uh, assembly in the back, that package also comes with these two, this is two pieces. Uh, there's a little slidey part on the front and a rubber gasket that just pushes right onto this peg here in the back. And what you want to do is feed the brake line once it's come through the other side of the bike through this part all the way out to that part. And then we'll move forward to installing uh, this and the brake line in the back assembly. Okay, starting to look pretty good here, except the closer I get to having the brakes all arranged, the more I'm realizing, uh, let's get a good shot of it here, that the brake cable is actually up against the tire, <laughs> which is not going to do at all. Now, this is not not going to be a problem in the long term, but it is a problem now, so I'm going to have to disassemble the brake at least, or loosen it up significantly uh, before I can ride the bike over to my bike shop. Um, as you can see back here, this back tire can go back quite a ways. And I, I have a feeling it was actually a lot further back originally. And that one of the reasons that the brake system came off this bike in the first place is because the chain broke and they shortened the chain. They Instead of adding back the links that they lost um, that would set the tire back farther where, where it probably belongs or originally belonged, uh, they just closed the gap uh, of the chain and brought the tire forward, which means they had to lose the brakes in order to make that happen. Uh, now it's possible we can, we can add, since we've got a great deal of brake line here, we might be able to add some, um, some points of resistance where the line comes around and, and, you know, grabs something solid out here that keeps it further back and then comes from here to the, to the lines. I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to ask the experts because, uh, again, I'm just not a brake expert. This is my first time actually running a line. Um, and I'll tell you what, I've, I'm enjoying it, and I'm really glad I did it because I'm learning a lot here in the process. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but I think the next thing to do is to take this thing into my local bike shop. And um, this chain is old, and it was pretty rusted out when I got it anyway. So I'm going to buy a new chain, and you, it's going to have to be longer than any of the factory stock sizes. So we'll use links from this old chain. Uh, and I'll keep the old chain in case, it, you know, the new one breaks or in case this ever happens again. Um, and we will add links of this chain to the new chain to make a chain long enough to kick the tire back far enough to get the brake system in play. That's the plan. some bad news. Turns out no matter how far back we take the tire, uh, the brake, the, the, the part of the brake that, that uh, supports the brake line is just not long enough to get to the front of the tire. So we're putting it back together now with a new chain, which is definitely better than the old chain. Um, but I'm going to have to look for some new brake parts that are custom for this bike. So you know what? Some things are hard. And when you get them done, that's when you're really satisfied because they were hard. And this bike is turning out to be like that. <laughs> All right. All right, third bike shop was the charm. I went to uh, Reseda Bicycles in uh, Daniel LaRusso's old hangout. <laughs> and I found 135 millimeter long arm calipers, uh, whereas the ones on the bike right now are 100 mils. So I'm hoping that extra 35 mils will get it, be enough to get the brake line situated in front of the tire with a little bit of clearance. We shall see. I'm going to install these new ones now and uh, we'll, we'll touch base again then. All right, we are almost there. As you can see, my brake line now clears my tire and by quite some margin. So that's kind of nice. Um, I did go ahead and try to adjust this to get it right. The problem I'm running into is um, the line runs up through here all the way up to my handlebar uh, where the lever is. And as I turn the handlebars back and forth, as you can see, it provides more or less tension on the brake line. So before I'm able to tighten that down and do the final adjustments to make it the right distance away from the rim for the pads, uh, I'm going to need some like mounting points to keep this line from moving back and forth so that I can run a little slack up here at the front uh, so that that isn't an issue anymore. But I don't have those mounts 
because of course I'm learning this as I go. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm doing it myself at this point in the game because I'm learning every little step of the process of how to run a brake line. And um, it's, it's really, really informative. So super fun. Uh, almost there. I think I just need to get some mount points in to, to, to stabilize some of the tension on the line. And I think we'll be good with the brakes. Okay, so after I resolve that final brake tensioning situation, there are two more items I would like to add to the bike uh, in this part one restoration phase to make it safe and rideable uh, here on the city streets of Los Angeles. Um, I definitely am going to need some mirrors because this bike is, it's really difficult to with the high handlebars to turn around and look behind you. Uh, so this is a case where I don't have, a, I don't have mirrors on a lot of my bikes, but for this one, I think it's totally called for. And I've picked up a couple of retro style mirrors that really are going to enhance the like old school motorcycle chopper look of this bike, I think. And I've also found an LED retro style headlight and i'm not entirely sure how this thing installs um or <laughs> how to open it weirdly enough to get the batteries in because it did not come with any instructions but i'm going to find out and i will talk about it when i get there uh <laughs> let's do the the uh the mirrors first and pop those on the handlebars and i'll show you what those look like well it was pretty straightforward all it took was a little ratchet head on a screwdriver um and these two bolts snap right around the handlebars. Uh, there is a tensioner here, a, a, a swivel nut, so that you can get this in the right place, in the right position before you lock it down. Uh, pretty straightforward, I like how they look. Um, obviously in part two of this video, I'm gonna need to readdress these handlebars. They're just in pretty poor shape and taking them down to the metal obviously has exposed them to some oxidation already. Uh, and they really contrast against the, <laughs> the shiny chrome of these brand new mirrors. So. Definitely gonna have to do something about rechroming that. I'm gonna wait until part two of this video because part two is going to be uh, the electrification of this ride. <laughs> and I think, well, I'm pretty sure actually that there's gonna be some more gadgets that get handed, uh, added to the handlebars when that setup goes into play. So until I'm sure where everything's gonna go, uh, I'm, I know I'm gonna have to take the handlebar assembly and all of its bits and pieces back off again. So I'm just gonna try to get this writable now here in part one, and I think we're almost there. All right, so as for this headlight, I did figure it out in the end. Oh my goodness. As you can see here, we've got a hinge on this side and there is a lock screw here. So if you remove that lock screw and then you come at this with a, a just a small flathead screwdriver and push in directly where the seam hits under that lock screw, there's a, a little plate underneath, a little latch that's grabbing the front. And if you push it back, the front pops open, the internal mechanism pops out and you can pop your two AA batteries in uh, and then close it back up again just by snapping it together and reinserting that lock screw. So that's how that works. Don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, regarding the mount, this was kind of weird, honestly. Um, this gap, I think, was meant to close around this singular fin that comes off of the retro light. Um, I didn't like that so much. So what I did was I added uh, this lock nut and it's oversized, so the, it's the, the diameter, the internal diameter here, the hole, is much bigger than the screw, um, and I'm actually using that as a spacer in between uh, the gap there to just kind of give it something to, to grab onto. And the reason I used a lock screw was because it has these teeth on the side that you can see that actually dig into um, the fin to hold it nice and tight when it, when this thing is locked down. I also used a lock screw or a lock washer, as you can see on the outside edge to make a good firm grab there too. I probably would have used two lock washers, one on the other side, but the screw just wasn't that long and I didn't feel like replacing it with a different screw since this came with it. Um, this is what, here we go. This is what a lock washer looks like in case you have never seen one before. Uh, I've got a whole collection of these just from past projects, but you can pick these up extraordinarily inexpensively at the hardware store, both of these items, if you need them, probably in a pack of like 50 or 100. And if you do that once, you'll have them for forever. <laughs> so now that I've got this thing fairly secure, I want to mount it to the bike. And I think the best way to do that is going to be with a self-tapping screw. Uh, so I'm going to mark my hole where I want it on the handlebars and uh, screw this puppy into place. All right, so I have found the self-tapping screw I want to use here. Uh, it's a nice clean head, it's brand new, and it has the self-tap drill on the back of it. Uh, it's also nice and fat, 
I'm going to be using a lock washer in addition here to make sure that when I screw down through the screw through the lock washer to the bracket that I have a really strong grab down into uh, into the rack where I'm mounting this headlight. I don't want it to slip and sliding around while I'm riding. Um, so self-tappers are great. Uh, however, they can be less than precise on occasion. So what I have done here is taken a very similarly sized drill bit and I have started to pre-drill out the hole where I want this self-tapper to go. Now I haven't gone all the way through. I've gone about half of the way through this plate here, but that gives me enough so that I can get that self-tapping uh, bit in there into that little section and it won't slide around and it'll go straight through when I'm ready to do that. So that should be next. I'm gonna um, come back over here. I'm gonna loosen this bracket so that I can swivel it down and give myself a bit more of a clear angle to get the screw in. Um, I have extended the bit here on my drill so that I'm not gonna have any conflict with the handlebars. I mean, likewise, you could just remove the handlebars for this operation, but I think I can get around that. Um, so I'm not going to. Yeah, and then I will relocate the position of the headlight how I want it and tighten this back up again when I am done. All right, I think that came out pretty amazingly, actually. <laughs> the switch is pretty functional, easy to use while riding. And uh, yeah, I think the bike's starting to look pretty good. So now the last step is to get... I, the brakes are pretty much ready. I just need some tensioners um, in order to bring the line up so that it, they're, uh, it's, it's all lined up properly and functional and that it doesn't change when I move the handlebars back and forth. So for this, uh, again, I'm going to return to a bike shop because I'm, I'm not an expert in this. In fact, it's my first time through, and I'm going to make sure it's done right the first time um, so that then I can learn how to do it <laughs> for, for, for other bikes moving forward. So, uh, yeah, off to the bike shop, and we will try to get this situated. Okay, I am back from the bike shop, and it turns out it did not need a tensioner at all. <laughs> like, at all. What it needed was a housing for the uh, brake cable, which gives it a bit of tension just in the way that it's run. And, and, and to, like, lengthen it out and to set it up against where it's, it hits the frame was enough tension to keep it in place. And this extra slack out here keeps it from uh, opening and closing the calipers when I turn the handlebars back and forth so now a it's fixed and working and beautiful and b i know how it functions which is really for me <laughs> the most key part because i didn't want to go into this blind and do it wrong uh, i gave it a bit of a test drive it is riding just fine so i'm going to go ahead and call it this is part one this bike is fully restored um, fully functional as a bicycle. Part two of this video, of course, is going to include electrification. I'm not entirely sure how I want to do that yet. I'm examining options, so I will be back in part two to talk about how we make this bike both bicycle, like traditional bicycle, and electric. Uh, and then in part three, which will be much shorter than either of the first two parts, we're going to do some beautification. I'm going to fix, uh, clean up the, the handlebars a bit more than they actually are at present. Uh, and I'm going to add some finishing touches. I think this bike needs some storage bags. I'm going to put some leather touches onto the electric accoutrements, um, and we're going to make it just a beautiful little electric chopper bike. Uh, until then, I will see you next time on Make and Believe.